Okay, so welcome everybody to the Bullet Points Lunchtime webinar series on firearm injury prevention for clinicians. I'm Dr. Amy Barnhorst and I'm gonna be moderating today's session. We're really excited to have Drs. Patricia Logan-Green and Mickey Spurlick from the University of Buffalo School of Social Work, who are here to talk about the role of social workers in firearm injury prevention. A few housekeeping announcements first. Mark your calendars for the third Tuesday of the month at noon Pacific time for our webinars. Just a quick 30 minutes so you can sit and eat your lunch and learn while you listen um, about firearm injury prevention. Our next webinar is going to be May 17th at noon with Dr. Kara Tolls, who is the Director of Equity and Inclusion in our UC Davis Department of Emergency Medicine. And she's going to talk about cultural humility in counseling for firearm injury prevention. We'll also have a poll at the beginning and at the end of the webinar. They're super short. And again, these polls help us understand where you're coming from, what you know as our audience, and what you learned from our webinars. So we're going to launch the opening poll for everybody right now. It'll just take a minute, and then I'll introduce our panelists. OK, thanks, everyone, who filled that out. Um, and just a reminder, use the Q&A function if you have questions. If um, if there's something really urgent that needs to be addressed, we'll see it in there if it's like a tech issue, but otherwise I'll go through the questions at the end and have our presenters answer them when we have Q&A time. And without further delay, I would like to introduce them. So uh, Dr. Logan Green is an associate professor at the University of Buffalo. She takes a trauma-informed approach to violence and childhood adversity. Her research projects involve the examination of the effects of childhood maltreatment on aggression, delinquency, and health mental health outcomes throughout the lifespan, and an NIH-funded grant to examine the effects of child neglect and poverty on adolescent outcomes. Recently, she shifted her attention to the prevention of gun violence. And Dr. Spurlick is on faculty at the University of Buffalo Social Work. She's a midwife and researcher who studies the effect of trauma and mental health challenges related to reproduction. She's committed to the advancement of trauma-informed care examining the social work response to gun violence and developing and evaluating interventions which address issues experienced by survivors of trauma, which are directed at interrupting intergenerational cycles of violence. Drs. Logan Green and Spurlick also wrote a recent blog post for our Bullet Points website leading up to today's webinar on leveraging social work to address gun violence, a call to action. So please take a look on our website if you haven't yet. And I wanna thank both of our presenters so much for coming. You can both take it away from here. Thank you so much for having us today. We are so appreciative of the important work that Bullet Points is doing in regard to fire, fire and violence prevention. So we're just excited to be here and be part of this. Um, we would also be remiss if we didn't thank our funders. Dr. Chris Reynolds is an alumnus of the University at Buffalo and he and his wife, Jody have been very generous in providing seed money for our research on this issue. So we're grateful to them too. A uh, quick note about terminology. Um, technically, the word guns is a broader term that could include any projectile or firearm mechanism, firing mechanism, like water guns, nail guns, cap guns, et cetera, whereas the term firearm is more specific to the weapons we're most concerned with. Many professionals and researchers pref prefer to use the term firearms exclusively. However, the common vernacular, most people use the word guns, so we'll be switching back and forth today with apologies to anyone who feels that firearms should be used exclusively. So why is there a need for social workers to address firearm violence? The first reason is because as this chart shows, the United States far exceeds our peer nations for both suicide and homicide. A big factor for this is likely that the United States is also the leader among the top 10 gun owning countries in the world. There are more guns than people in the United States, as many of you probably already know, which never fails to stagger me. According to the CDC Whiskers database, in 2019, nearly 40,000 people in the United States lost their lives due to firearms. This includes almost 24,000 suicides and over 14,000 homicides, in addition to deaths from accidents, legal intervention, mostly meaning police, in addition to deaths of undetermined causes. Gun deaths have been increasing in the last few years, especially homicide. In 2020, about 45,000 people died from gun violence, an increase of about 5,000, with most increases seen in the category of homicides. We're still waiting for the full data from 2021, but early reports suggest that it was also a brutal year. 
Um, many of you have probably noticed the news reports lately that we've seen about a really strongly increasing trend towards mass shootings. And these are horrific and high profile in terms of news coverage, but it's important to remember that they represent less than 1% of all deaths in the United States related to firearms. We don't want to ignore mass shootings, of course, especially because of the impact they can have on entire communities, but we want to put them in perspective when thinking about gun violence prevention and policy. Of course, death by firearm is not the only issue. There are also a lot of non-fatal injuries due to firearms that are approximately double the number of fatalities in each year, in part because medical personnel have gotten so good at treating trauma victims. This means that a lot of Americans are living with injuries from firearms. This can cause lifelong disabilities in addition to any mental health impacts they may experience. But also note that those injured by gun violence are not the only ones affected. Each individual is surrounded by family members and other loved ones who are affected by their, the injury or death of the victim. Moreover, entire communities feel these effects, especially communities where shootings are frequent. So if we focus just on the gun um, fatalities each year, we will vastly underestimate the effects of guns on this country. The argument in our work is that social workers are well positioned to make a dent in the number of firearm injuries each year for a variety of reasons. First, social workers are already in contact with many of the most vulnerable populations. So this includes those who are at risk of suicide, as well as those who are at risk of being victimized or even of perpetrating firearm violence. We want to, we also want to know that we, sorry, we are also trained to discuss sensitive topics respectfully and without bias. This is a big part of social work training. And we may already have trusting relationships that allow us to encourage safe firearm practices and reduce injury among our client populations. I do want to acknowledge that this, a lot of this is not unique to social work, of course, but we feel that social work lags behind other disciplines in both our training on addressing firearm violence, as well as our attention to these issues in research and practice. There's actually almost no research out there about how much social workers are talking to their clients about firearms. The only quantitative study that we are aware of, which was done by our um, friend and collaborator, Karen Slovak with her team, only 34% of practicing social workers from a sample in Ohio reported regularly assessing for firearm violence. Those are the two agree and strongly disagree columns in black there on the right. And only 15.4% reported regularly counseling clients about firearm safety, which reflects the right hand gray columns. So on one hand, this means that some social workers are already talking about these issues with their clients regularly, which is great, but the vast majority are not. And I'll let Mickey um, tell us a little bit more about some things we've done. Thanks, Patricia. So owing to this sort of general lack of focus that we saw, we decided that we would do an exploratory qualitative study. Um, we did this with 27 social workers in New York. We asked them about how often they discuss guns with clients, what kind of training they've had or whether they've had training, and what they would want from any trainings, and also how they view the role of social workers in preventing gun violence and gun injury. What we found was that most participants rarely discussed gun safety with clients outside of the context of doing lethality assessments, and even those were inconsistent. Some specific barriers were identified, including political differences, uh, client resistance to talking about the topic and agency norms that didn't really support those conversations. Some social workers reported they discussed the, the topic comfortably and frequently and stressed the importance of kind of putting aside their personal beliefs as social workers often do for other areas um, that include sensitive topics. And many participants spoke of the complexity of addressing gun culture as they termed it, in all their interactions with clients across both rural and urban communities. Conversations that did happen around guns were typically, as I mentioned, in the context of suicidality and lethality assessments, rather than as any kind of routine safety assessment. So looking specifically at education, 
most participants shared that they had received very little in the way of formal training on guns during their university education. Some few reported that they had limited on the job training. For example, they may have had like active shooter drill training if they worked in a school setting. Overall, most participants shared that they really wanted more practical training about guns, including understanding the different types of guns, the laws and policies that are involved, and how to effectively assess for risk of harm to, uh, to self or others. Some social workers also empathized with client perceptions about the need for guns to remain safe in their current uh, environment. Participants also expressed concerns for their own safety in relation to weapons and the possession of clients, particularly for those who did home visiting. Curiously, although the role of uh, broader societal norms around firearms was certainly mentioned, few social workers discussed the need for macro level work in this area. So responsive to this research, uh, we decided that we'd like to take on the task of developing some dedicated education for social workers around this. Thus, we're developing a four module continuing education offering for social workers that provides much more detail about the information we're covering today and includes video interviews with leaders in policy, research, and intervention. The course will also provide access to resources that clinicians can use to further educate themselves and their clients. Our goal with this is to help social workers just to be better prepared to intervene to prevent gun violence. The course that we're developing will be offered through the University at Buffalo School of Social Work's Continuing Ed Office, and I've put the, this is the link to their catalog there. It's not available yet, but soon. Um, back to you, Patricia. So I'm gonna to touch a little bit around some of the policy debates that we think are particularly relevant to anyone working in the mental health field. As I think everybody here recognizes, gun control debates are very heated in the United States, although the political discourse is often very different from public opinion polls. For example, the vast majority of Americans support universal background checks for all firearm purchases, but those laws haven't been passed largely because of lobbying efforts by gun rights organizations, such as the NRA. So right now, policies are mostly being left to the states where laws can vary widely. So as we know, a lot of guns are purchased legally without background checks, either from an individual or through the famous gun show loophole. In addition to being purchased in the underground market, being stolen, being given by another person, or being assembled through ordered parts, this is known as the ghost guns, some states are trying to address these issues with various um, regulations, but no new federal laws have been passed in years and none are expected anytime soon. States vary, especially right now on some other issues, so, such as who can have what type of access. So this includes things like requiring permits to own a handgun or other kinds of firearms, concealed or open carry, and the current rise in the number of states that allow permitless carry. And if we had unlimited time, we would talk more about that because it's very important. States may also try to regulate hardware and ammunition such as silencers or the so-called assault weapons or maximum magazine capacity. Other states have passed laws that may require owners to report stolen guns or store their guns in safe ways. We strongly recommend that social workers and other viewers educate themselves in some of these debates within their state, and particularly as relates to the types of clients they see of their mental health practitioners. So many individuals believe that um, people who have a severe mental health diagnosis or who have been hospitalized voluntarily cannot purchase guns, but state laws vary a lot on reporting criteria and standards and the federal guidelines in this are complex and spotty. We've had some high profile shootings made by individuals who should have been prohibited by, from purchasing firearms, but that data, that information never made it to the systems that are screened during a background check. This is actually a really complicated process, more so than most people have awareness about. So it's important for practitioners to know their state's reporting laws and to advocate for closing any gaps. Also to make sure that these laws aren't stigmatizing or scapegoating individuals with a mental health diagnosis. 
Individuals with domestic violence convictions are also supposed to be prohibited from purchasing firearms, as are some individuals who are subject to an order of protection, but many gaps in these laws remain. A famous one is the boyfriend or girlfriend loopholes. Um, federal laws after gun regarding gun excess after a domestic violence conviction specify married couples, so crimes against dating partners don't fit those criteria. Additionally, being prohibited from purchasing a new weapon has little to do with any firearms that an individual may already own. Some states mandate confiscation for these individuals, but others do not, and implementation of confiscation is another issue. Some states are requiring that certain types of guns be locked away safely and may even penalize owners if, for example, a child uses an unsecured um, weapon. These are called child access prevention laws or cap laws. 19 states in the District of Columbia have laws that impose criminal liability on persons who negligently store their firearms. Um, this is also a relevant issue for people who live with others who shouldn't have access to firearms, such as elders who, who have dementia or other vulnerable persons. So anyone who's in practicing in the mental health field, who is counseling their parents about their patients about firearm access needs to be aware of their living situations, as well as their state laws on these issues to make sure they're giving good advice. The last policy framework I'll talk about briefly is increasing the population It's called extreme risk protection orders or ERPOs. These place temporary restrictions on gun ownership for individuals displaying high risk for harm to self or others and who have firearms. This is a civil court process usually brought by law enforcement. However, in some states, family members can file, file the petition and in a smaller number of states, employers or mental health practitioners can too, which is somewhat controversial. However, in all of this, it's really important to draw a distinction between being high risk for firearm violence and having a mental illness. These are not the same things at all and individuals with a mental illness are far more likely to be injured by violence than they are to perpetrate it. Great, thanks, Patricia. We're gonna talk a little bit about um, some tools. So when assessing for violence, there are several tools available that help us understand risk. It's especially important to assess for a client's risk when they're demonstrating any worrying or threatening behavior certainly if they're expressing any suicide ideation, or when you just have general concern for their safety or the safety of those in their environment. <clears throat> Some general recommendations for all risk assessment tools are to look for those that are externally validated and have been validated with the population of interest that you're working with. We also want to use those that are based on sound methodology that have had full psychometric evaluation done and have evidence of usefulness, feasibility, and acceptability. They should also be systematic and comprehensive in nature. However, it's important to remember that although such tools are generally meant for clinician usage, they don't provide direction on how to act in specific situations, right? So overall assessment of risk should be based on multiple sources of information, including the assessment tools, but also if you have access to them, medical records, other documentation, any statements of concern from uh, any interested parties, as well as any risk communication on the part of the client, which could either be direct or indirect verbal communication of, of suicide or homicide intention. Specific to immediate risk for gun violence or accidental injury or death, Pinholt and colleagues offer the mnemonic of the five L's. Is the gun locked? Is it loaded? Is the potential operator of the firearm feeling low? Are little children present in the home? Is the potential operator of the firearm learned in the firearms usage and safety? Now in their study, they focus particularly on older adults as such being learned in this case might also involve possible navigation of symptoms of dementia. However, the five L's seem appropriate to any setting in which a firearm is present. Asking about gun storage is so important given that research has shown that 54% of gun owners do not store their guns safely. And that translates to about 4.6 million minors living with unsecured guns, just to put that in perspective. 
It's also important to convey that unsecured guns are more likely to be stolen or used by unintended individuals and that safe storage may be required by law in some jurisdictions. Ideally, all guns should be stored unloaded with ammunition locked away separately, locked or in a safe, and with keys and combinations to those locks in, inaccessible. So social workers work with many persons at risk of perpetrating or being victimized by gun violence. At such, as such, we're really in an optimal position to have the kinds of sensitive conversations we need to ascertain risk and safe, safe storage. However, doing this is going to require special, very specific education on all of these relevant issues to prepare social workers to respond. And will include understanding the policy debates and the local laws that are influential. Many tools specific to assessing for gun risk for gun violence are available and definitely social workers should familiarize themselves with those. So in, uh, in short, we really think that social workers and mental, other mental health professionals, professionals can play a really vital role in preventing uh, gun violence. And we just really appreciate you listening to what we had to say. That went really fast. Um, and here's some of the references uh, from our talk as well. And with that, um, we'll just open it up to um, question and answer. Thank Thanks you so much, time. both of you, for that great presentation. That was excellent. Um, and before we go to the question and answer, we're going to launch our quick closing poll. It'll just take a minute. So once that's been filled out, then I will go through some of that. We've got some really good audience questions. So, OK, great. Um, so uh, questions from the audience. We'll start with the first and kind of an easy one, which is, um, is there a cost associated with the continuing education course? And if so, how much? Um, the short answer is, uh, it depends. We're probably going to be um, trying to evaluate its use for people. We'll do, you know, pre post test sort of clinical evaluation and there will not be costs for people who do it that way. Um, outside of the studies, there, there will be a cost associated with it as mandated by our continuing education department, but it's still to be determined. Excellent. Um, we had uh, two questions that I'll kind of roll into one, which are, can you give some examples or anecdotes or share some stories about what would be the kind of situation where a social worker might be well poised to um, talk to a patient about firearms? Well, certainly, as we mentioned, in any, any times that you're having concern about um, uh, lethality, about suicide ideation, right? Um, uh, it's really important to ascertain, does this person have access? So they not only have the intent, but do they have actually have access to a weapon, right? And not just a firearms necessarily. Um, and so, and what we really hope is that that would be more routine than it actually is, right? Um, in when we're doing those kinds of assessments, whether it be the danger assessment is one that's used frequently in domestic violence situations, which is asking about um, you know, who has weapons, who has access to them, have, have there been threats, that sort of thing. Um, but it would really depend on the context that the social worker is working in. Um, but it is, it is difficult to have these conversations, you know, because um, we don't want to, you know, impose our uh, worldviews on other people in the process of that or, or or make people feel uncomfortable that we have are making big broad assumptions. Um, but the truth is that um, suicide is much more success, or not successful, but is completed much more often um, if there is a weapon like a firearm present in that person's sphere. So I'm not sure that fully answers the question. It, um, anything you would want to add to that, Patricia? There are a lot of situations, um, in fact, so many we feel like it should be part of a routine assessment, the same way um, we might assess for other risks in the home. So we, it's a routine matter to ask, for example, whether any domestic violence is occurring in the home, or we think it should be routine to ask if there are firearms in the home. This is relevant for anybody with kids. And by kids, we don't just mean little kids, we mean adolescents too. Anybody who might be living with a vulnerable person, 
as well as those who might later have mental health um, or uh, challenges or a crisis that makes them more vulnerable to the impulsive use of a weapon for self-harm. Um, there's just, there's so many situations that we feel like it should be part of our routine assessment for clients. Great, thank you. Um, well, here's a question from a fellow social worker and a eight time national rifle champion and board member of Walk the Talk America. And he, he asks if um, you had someone work with you to develop your gun culture presentation uh, from to just to make sure that information was non biased. <laughs> so I was I was looking at this question and it's really interesting. You know, we both slipped sideways into research on gun violence from very other lines of um, expertise. So we, we have been on a st steep learning curve from a long, for a long time. Um, the short answer is no, no one worked with us. This is our work. Um, we are definitely striving to be neutral in our language. So I appreciate these comments. I have questions that we don't really have time to get into. So if this person would be willing to email us, I'd love to have a dialogue with them about about this and some of the other things that they said in the comments. If you have anything to add, Mickey. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I got interested in this when I finally, you know, I'm a perinatal mental health researcher, when I finally wrapped my head around the stats, which um, when you look at risk for mortality amongst pregnant women and women who are um, uh, in the postpartum period. And what's the highest risk? It's not an obstetric cause, it's actually homicide or suicide. And so that's what really compelled me. Um, and, you know, we're, we're working with the presumption that the more social workers know, the more they can have these conversations, the more actual violence that can be prevented. But we're also really aware, and that's something that came out in our um, qualitative research that, um, that many social workers are gun owners. They do, you know, they they uh, hunt. They um, some carry it for personal protection. So we, you know, we've had to constantly kind of check our own biases around this work. You know, looking at this because we definitely want the course that we're developing to be relevant for any social worker, no matter where they stand on firearms and Second Amendment rights and all of that. You know, we want it. We want it to be welcoming to all people. So. I just uh, underscore Patricia's um, comment that I would love to, you know, talk to any of you out there that do have more to say about gun culture. Um, would really appreciate hearing that. And and also just to be transparent, you know, part of our trying to learn more was, you know, we went to a gun range and we, uh, you know, we familiarized ourselves with with weapons. And we've been talking to people in terms of the experts who are contributing to our course. Um, you know, it wasn't a requisite for them to be on one side of the fence or other. We just really want to get at what are the, what are the, what's the information out there and how can we help people to access it basically. Awesome. Thank you. Um, what, we have time for one last question and I just want to say there's a number of other questions in the chat and um, I'm hoping those folks can reach out by email because there's some questions about the survey and some other things. So, um, you have Drs. Logan Green and Spurlick's email here, and I think that they would probably be excited to hear um, more about your interest. But the last question I just wanted to bring up is how can social workers keep themselves safe when their clients might have firearms? This is such an important issue, um, especially in states that have um, a very, where, where uh, concealed carry is very popular and common. Um, we address it in a little bit more detail in our in our course, um, but it's it's hard to do in 30 seconds. The short version would be to ask clients directly about any firearms they may have, and you know, in a non-judgmental, non-biased way, as well as to be aware when they're doing home visits whether there are firearms and how accessible um, those would be. Um, it's this. It's a very important issue that this brief answer is not going to not going to address very well here. Right, and and I, to add that to that, I would add, you know, working with your supervisor that if you're out doing home visiting and that sort of thing, you know, you should be working with a supervisor who's going to help you to figure out what kind of triage do I need to do before I go into someone's home, and looking at all the, you know all the relevant um, information there is to be cleaned, kind of like what I was saying about assessment, that we can't just rely on that one 
one assessment tool, we, we're, we're, we're going to look to multiple sources of information, right, um, to do our overall assessment. Well, thank you both so much for this great presentation. As a fellow mental health professional, I, I echo the things you say here and how important it is for us. Um, and thanks to our audience for this great discussion and all these questions. You can look out for a follow-up email with the recording from this webinar and the registration for May's webinar. And um, thank you all for coming. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for having us. It's been great working with you.